universities have become, and this is also a problem, have become overwhelmingly left dominated. And I don't mean like, I mean, super majorities. I think there's 12 times as many, uh, according to Sam Abrams research, something like 12 times as many left leaning administrators as there are right leaning ones. You know, you literally have departments that have no conservatives. So Craig, we're going from coddling to cancelling uh, in your new book. Um, one of the stories in it maybe is in, indicative of the of the overall thrust of it all. Tell us about um, Erica Lopez Prater um, as a way into this. Oh, sure. Yeah, that, 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 that's a case out in Minnesota. Um, this is a professor who taught an art history class. Um, she was uh, wanted to feature Islamic art as well. Uh, and she uh, had a class that actually had a picture, I think from maybe the 14th century or something like that, that was requested by a Muslim prince and done by a Muslim artist. Um, she warned about that being part of the class on the syllabus. She warned students in advance and she did it again. And then she showed it in class and then she lost her job um, under the claim that essentially this was, you know, this was wrong to do to, to, do to students. Um, Americans can be very parochial in our understanding of the world. My, my mother's British, my father's Russian. Uh, they immediately assumed this this is offensive to all Muslims. And of course, there were you know, one of the commentators on this was a Muslim woman herself saying like, no, actually, this is if it's a mockery of, uh, of Muhammad, that's one thing. But this is devotional art. Like not all Muslims think this is actually even offensive. Um, and what's amazing there is even though there was tremendous blowback from an academic freedom and free speech standpoint after she lost her job, uh, and even though the president is now considering retire early retirement, they've come back down on the side of this was totally the appropriate uh, thing to do, which is n not at all compatible with academic freedom or free speech. And how indicative of that is a problem? Because we've got to be cautious here, haven't we, that cancel culture is often thrown around as a term. It's why I think you wanted to write, write this book, that it's it's easily thrown around and it's said to, to, to stretch over a vast spectrum of ideas. But do you fundamentally believe there is a problem in institutions in America and therefore in the US where actually the easiest response of those in authority is to push away and silence rather than engage with? I don't just believe I know. I've been working on campuses for 22 years. I'm very familiar with the history of freedom of speech and academic freedom. I'm a First Amendment lawyer. Um, and we can find no period with this number of professors getting fired or otherwise punished since McCarthyism. Um, and the law, by the way, wasn't even established back then. It took from 1957 to 1973 to, to strongly protect academic freedom and campus free speech uh, by the uh, under the First Amendment. And uh, so, so I always feel constantly gaslit by people who don't work on campus saying this isn't even happening um, as uh, it's like, no, look at the numbers. Look at the, like th this is there's no comparison. I always give the comparison of 9-11. Um, I started right after 9-11. And, you know, of course, there were professors joking about the attacks and, you know, calling the uh, the, the victims of 9-11 little Eichmanns, also you know, highly unsympathetic stuff. And those those were my first cases, but they're free speech. And that's what I do. Um, but even in that context, we could find about, you know, maybe 15 cases of, of uh, attempts to silence professors. Three professors were fired. And really, all three of those were justified under legitimate other other means. And that was probably the most typical threat to academic freedom, which is when there's a national security crisis and people clamp down the patriotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we haven't had that since 2014. And our definition of cancel culture are the uptick of campaigns to get people fired, et cetera, uh, since 2014. Um, and now one of the things we present in the book is we're talking about a thousand attempts to get professors punished in some way, often fired. We're talking about about two thirds of them result in someone getting punished, about 200 firings, which is, you know, uh, twice as many as actually happened during the, under the standard estimate of how many professors were fired under McCarthyism. And we also know this is a wild undercount. Now, meanwhile, one of the things that's funny about the culture war is when I start explaining this, when I also add, by the way, do you know that one third of those professors we're talking about who were punished? were also punished from the right, that basically usually off-campus forces demanding someone get punished. And I've noticed that if that's suddenly the thing that makes them take this seriously, that they gain s s some appreciation for the topic, but I lose all respect for them because you should care about free speech even when it's not your ox being gored. But is that to imply at the very least the majority are from the left then? If there's a, there's a... Oh, sure. And, and why is that? Why, I mean, yeah. why is that? Why is that? Is there something fundamentally intolerant there? Why, why would that be the case? Because it should at some level be... 
50-50, I suppose, if you think about it uh, in binary terms. Well, it, it, it couldn't be because universities have become, and this is also a problem, have become overwhelmingly left dominated. And I don't mean like, I mean, super majorities. I think there's 12 times as many, uh, according to Sam Abrams research, something like 12 times as many left leaning administrators as there are right leaning ones. You know, you literally have departments that have no conservatives uh, whatsoever. Now, I am an old fashioned liberal. I still consider myself left of center. There is a major divide by people who these days call themselves progressives on issues like freedom of speech. And the, the lack of viewpoint diversity on campus is one of the reasons why you have this group think you have this circling the wagons, you know, turning on people uh, uh, who, who say offensive things. And, and of course, you know, people will immediately go to the accountability culture argument, which all it means is usually that someone hasn't looked into this very well. And they assume that everybody who got punished had it coming. But I defy anyone to read my book and think that, you know, any like maybe they'll think a couple of them did have it coming. But a couple uh, we, we give uh, so many examples. We try to get present a lot of data and really try to get people to take this issue much more seriously. Um, what's the reason? then? does this come back to your coddling thesis uh, of your previous book, which is a sort of argument that we've we over prioritize feelings, that there is a sort of sense that everyone has and maybe this, this this comes from a good place that we start listening to people talk about themselves more, maybe talking a little bit more about mental health is a broadly a good thing because people can be more honest about things that are going on uh, inside their brains. But ultimately, it creates a world in which one person's self-diagnosed mental wellness is a trump card in a debate about what can and cannot be said. Yeah, uh, and, and there are definitely a lot of connections between coddling and canceling in the American mind. We, we, we think that that's part of the, the dynamic, but one of the reasons why this book can't be as crowd-pleasing and as popular of a book as coddling is we really meant the subtitle, um, that, that essentially we think a lot of the stuff does come from good intentions and just some bad ideas that, that are over, largely over protection. When it comes to cancel culture, it, uh, it appeals to, um, there's, there, there's a, a great quote by Aldous Huxley talking about if you want to create a movement, give people permission to be cruel to people, give people uh, permission to actually like take out anger on them. And that's how you uh, unfortunately can attract people to it. There's a lot of cruelty um, in cancel culture. There's a lot of the very typical and very ancient, by the way, you know, instinct to fight the enemy, to get the blasphemer, get the heretic. Um, and even though at, even though it's often justified in compassion for people in the abstract, it's often incredibly cruel to flesh and bud people who, in, in the grand scheme of things, did nothing. Wrong. Let's talk about a, a real world example, I suppose, that's current at the minute. We spent a lot of this this week oh, yeah. debate. There's a lot going well, on. There, exactly. <laughs> so, so, we've, so we've had the debate yeah. in this country about the ability to protest whether something like free Palestine is an acceptable thing to say straight after a terrorist attack. Is singing a song from the river to the sea acceptable? Is supporting saying you agree with the aims of Hamas, except well, that's actually illegal in this country. In your, view, in your view, because Hamas is a prescribed terrorist organization, you're not allowed to support it. In your view, how absolutist would you go? Would you say that a, someone should have the freedom in an academic institution to say, free Palestine, from the river to the sea, I support Hamas. How far would you go down on, on, on that? All of them? Or would you stop somewhere? What, what, 100%. Because I, there's no such thing as a free speech absolutist. Um, because America, uh, First Amendment law actually has a number of exceptions. But the one thing that we are absolutist on is people are entitled to their opinion full stop. Even, And I make the point that the most important justification of freedom of speech is that it lets you know the world as it really is. You're not safer from the fact that people believe Hamas is good without knowing, for not knowing knowing that there are people out there who believe Hamas is good. Um, I, I think that, that censorship can give you this foolish and false sense of, of security. And I think that one of the things that might actually prompt meaningful reform on campus is seeing an environment in which it was so taken for granted at elite colleges um, that pro-Hamas statements were completely correct. Is And by the way, we, we will defend the right to have those statements. But one of the things that I believe created an environment where these students didn't think twice about it was that if you gave it a different opinion, you know, uh, most of the rest of the year, if you came out very pro-Israel, for example, you were canceled <laughs> or, or at least or 
afraid of being canceled. So I think a lot of the um, uh, a, a lot of the craziness we see on campus today, university presidents who comment on everything else in the entire world, being afraid um, initially, at least, to take a strong position on uh, on the uh, the initial Hamas attacks. I believe that's in part cancel culture, and I, I think it I think it has a more profound harm on the production of ideas, on the reliability of expertise, than people understand. Do you think people, therefore, particularly in left wing institutions, would have been frightened of saying? I support Israel's right to defend itself in the aftermath of Hamas because they're worried that that particular argument might not meet the, the popular appeal of, of a left wing institution. I, I know these people. I, I know these people are, are are scared in some cases of saying it. You know, they found, but partially because the public backlash against the, you know, how brutal some of these attacks were, gave the, you know, help help people get some backbone. And some of the people like Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard, coming coming out and saying, "Are you kidding me?" Uh, it probably helped. But yeah, I mean, like right now. Uh, universities, one, one of the arguments we make in the book is that universities should be at every stage um, uh, uh, trying to encourage nonconformity, open mindedness, free thinking, uh, being creative and being able to play with lots of ideas. And what I believe has happened in K through 12 and particularly elite higher education in the United States is that we have conformity inducing. Uh, devices that have actually created an unhealthy environment for, even though the marketplace of ideas isn't the best metaphor for free speech overall, it is a perfect metaphor for what campuses are supposed to be, where ideas battle it out and you, ho hopefully, ho not, not inevitably, but hopefully you get to better ideas um, through that process. So I guess the question is that there might be this discomfort in, in saying supporting Israel, for example, because of the political skew of, of the institution. But if we flip that around, some would say to you, Greg, it's dangerous to allow young minds to hear, for example, a pro Hamas statement. It is dangerous. It's fundamentally dangerous. And, and this is why we should protect freedom of speech, because this is one of the reasons why I think censorship is so short sighted. It doesn't change anyone's opinion. And we actually have real research on this in the book, by the way. Um, that I, I, I'm a First Amendment lawyer, but I'm also big into social psychology. As far as something that's really well established in social psychology is if you get people who already agree with each other to only talk to people they already agree with, they tend to get much more radicalized. So cancel culture, you know, has encouraged people to talk who they agree with. Um, the environment on campus has encouraged people to talk who they agree with. And it's, it's actually pushed uh, radicalization. So censorship can't make these ideas go away. And what they don't realize they're doing is they're making it more likely that you'll have a strike student who sees no problem whatsoever with there was nothing wrong with these attacks whatsoever to actually believe this is right because they've never bothered to actually or they were, they've, they've never actually interacted with someone who can moderate their opinion and i wonder whether social media does exactly the same thing because yes it, it encourages <laughs> it totally does and do you feel this is not just a u.s problem this could be a uk problem this is a fundamentally modern problem because we have a modern world in which um disagreement is seen so viscerally that that you, we separate into tribes. Social media reinforces that. The prevailing need to be right uh, uh, forces that. This view that everyone's own mental well-being is a trump card is a universal thing. Taken together, this wouldn't necessarily be a U.S. phenomenon. This is this may be a human human condition phenomenon. It, 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 interesting things. One, social media has sped up all of these problems and created new ones for sure. Just like the printing press, you know, in the short term, when you introduce that many people into a global conversation, it's going to be extremely disruptive. And we just introduced a billion additional people into a global conversation. So there's no way to get out of this period without it being kind of crazy. Interesting fact, though, is as best we can tell from my research with height, is that this is much worse in the Anglosphere for some reason. Um, it, it's okay. much worse in England. It's much worse in Canada and, uh, and, and the United States. I'm not, it doesn't seem to be quite as bad in Australia and New Zealand, but there are problems there there as well. Um, I think sometimes that some other countries have at least some built-in inoculation to, uh, uh, to this. Um, now, we have heard stories from Spain, et cetera. But anyway, um, I, I do think that the, uh, the the disruptive element of social media is something that we kind of roll our eyes at now because we're so used to hearing it. It's almost become a cliche. But I really got to get people to remember we are in 1521. We, we are when, you know, Henry VIII tried to put the genie back in the bottle, the printing press, also in 1538, um, that there there's no way for this not to be a crazy period. And we have to figure out thoughtful ways to navigate it. And that requires discussion and freedom of speech and a backbone is, is maybe and a maybe, backbone <laughs> yes absolutely and maybe that's an unfair thing to say but ultimately no no it's got, entirely fair we've got to be able to look each other in the eyes and say 
I disagree with you. I disagree you, with you. I don't okay. think you're a bad person, but, but I disagree with you. And even if you're saying something that that is fundamentally bad, it doesn't yeah. necessarily make you a bad. And actually, or maybe it doesn't, it might make you a bad person, but it doesn't matter if you're a bad person, maybe. It's, well, it's, we, we, we say this in the book, that so much of the way we debate, cause, because we, we try to situate cancel culture as being only the sort of mo- most drastic um, uh, part of a system for winning arguments without winning arguments, of ways to not actually, you, you know, engage with the debate. And one of the, one of the tactics is if I can prove you're bad and you said something bad 15 years ago or you did something bad uh, you know, 10 years ago, then I don't have to listen to you anymore. And unfortunately, if you know your history, it turns out that people who are absolute or like awful people sometimes are right and people who are saying sometimes are dreadfully wrong. 